All right, welcome to Vital Voices. It's great to see everyone. Uh, great to see everyone online. Uh, we're really excited about the presentation today uh, and lucky to have David Garlock presenting for us. Uh, so I'll tell you quickly for the people in the room and the people online, a little bit about the College of Public Service. So we are at University of Houston downtown, second largest university in Houston, most diverse university in Texas and in the Southern region. Uh, and in College of Public Service, we have social work, we have education, we have criminal justice. So we're gonna focus on criminal justice today, uh, though we feature presentations on all of those. So without further ado, I'm gonna uh, introduce our director of our center, Mr. Villano. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to our, uh, our first Vital Voices uh, Forum of the spring 2022 semester. I am, uh, I've been told by our speaker not to say too much about him because he wants to be able to say it all himself. So without further ado, I'm just gonna simply introduce him, introduce you to a wonderful person that I've recently got the pleasure to know, Mr. David Garlock. Hey, how y'all doing? For those of you here, you know, we, I, I know we have most of the people online and thank you for joining us. We're glad that you're here. Um, for those online, you can go ahead, raise your hand, use your hand thing on Zoom for this question if you'd like. Uh, one thing I always ask people is how many people here have family members, friends, or associates who have been, ever been incarcerated? Raise your hand. So that's about 60% of the people here, you know. That's typically when I speak in a university, that's what it is. About 60 to 80% of the people raise their hand. And I'm always baffled by that because here you are, typically 18 to 22 year olds, and you have had so much contact with incarceration, with prison. And it's like, wow, you know, why is this so? And that's why I love speaking in universities, you know, sharing my story, because there's times when I talk to people and I tell them that I'm formerly incarcerated and they're like, wait, what? You don't look like that, you know, you don't look like you're supposed to have been incarcerated. And one thing this is about is about changing the narrative. It's about letting people see that anybody can go to prison at any time for any type of offense. So what I want you guys to do right now, the people online, the people in here, just close your eyes. I'm going to start this off. So let me tell you about the topic. The, the, the title of my presentation is the chapters of my life. So I'm going to walk you guys through the different chapters of my life. And this poem is starting in chapter one. So moment was all that it took and my life was forever changed. I walked down those steps thinking we were playing hide and go seek. I was the first one to go hide. I found a closet and went in, hoping that I had found a good spot. Time went by. I felt good about my place. And then I was found. Nothing was said or done about my capture. Just darkness and silence. That is when the abuse began. Hands on me in ways it shouldn't be. I was in a state of shock and confusion. I could not move or say a word. Why was this happening? What was going on? I couldn't comprehend anything. When it all ended, I was told to go upstairs. I walked up each step and was in a stupor. Why did this happen? He pulled me to the side and told me that I would die if I ever told anyone. So now fear and confusion now filled my mind. How could I ever be the same? I went down those steps in an 11 year old and I came up as a broken person who now had to become everything for everyone. That right there is really the place where my story, this chapter on dysfunction and abuse really took a turn. So if you look at the picture on the screen, that was a, that's a picture of my family when I was like six years old. So you have my grandma, my grandpa, my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, and me. In 1986, when that picture was taken, yes, I'm old, but 1986, when that picture was taken, you would think this is what the typical American family looks like. Because everybody is there, the mother, the father, the grandma, the grandpa, the kids. It's one unit. We know in 2022, families look a lot different. But this family was not this American family. If you were to look at a picture dictionary and look up the word dysfunctional family, that's what you would have seen. 
because my family was very dysfunctional. My dad tried to kill my mom and sister one time when I was five years old. My dad was chasing my mom around with a hacksaw blade and threatening to kill her. My dad was an alcoholic. He was in Vietnam, came back, PTSD. Numerous times threatening my mom, my dad. My sister was kicked out of the house when she was 11 years old. So she was sent out of the home into a foster home and group home. And this was something that really broke my mom. That was one of the things that really changed their trajectory and ended up with them being divorced when I was nine years old. My brother was 12 years old. That situation continued the trajectory of my brother. It was then when he started using drugs and becoming involved with alcohol. There was one time he was uh, at this grocery store, was drunk, fell over, busted his head open, had to go to the hospital. My dad had to go there from work to get my brother. And he told him, if you get caught with drugs or alcohol again, you're going to get kicked out of the house just like your sister. About four weeks later, he was, he was found with marijuana. Was sent to a home just like my sister. But this home was different. This was a home for boys. The person that began to molest my brother and me had just gotten out of prison in North Carolina, and he moved to Washington State where we were living. He befriended the person running this home just with the aspect to be able to have access to boys. He started molesting my brother. After three months, he forced my brother out of this home and to move in with him. Two months after that, he gets the idea, the abuser gets the idea to go down to, Washington, uh, go down to California where my mom was living and she had been remarried and to talk my, my mom and stepdad into moving back up to Washington so they could see my brother and me. So why do you think this gentleman wanted my mom and my stepdad to come back up to Washington. So, so he could have access to me. Because with just my brother there, he didn't have that access. But now my mom comes back up to Washington. I hadn't seen her in two years. First time I go to see my mom, it was joyous. It was great for the, past, for the first two and a half, three hours. Then this gentleman is like, let's go play hide and go seek. As an 11 year old, what are you thinking? Like, OK, this is what we do. Let's let's do this. Let's have fun. But it was only fun for a little bit. And then that's when the abuse began. 11 years old. This abuse went on for eight years. Towards the end of the abuse, around 17, 18, it became more physical where this gentleman was beating the crap out of us. He'd also tried to kill my brother and I numerous times. With him though, my brother and I were working at a restaurant in Alabama. We had ended up in Alabama. We were working at this restaurant in Alabama. The gentleman wasn't. He would stand outside the restaurant and watch what we were doing. If we were flirting with a waitress, if we were flirting with a customer, when we got home, we got the crap beat out of us. This was a daily thing. Okay, but did you, did you end up dealing with that? After your parents left, or how did you end up dealing with one you got down? I you mean, repeat, repeat the question. So, the, so he, the question was, how did we end up in Alabama? So he had forced me to live with him too. And so at that point, it was in California. And so every time I went over to see my mom, which my dad would have me go see, that's when the abuse would continue to happen. And then he forced uh, me to move in with him too. And then that's when the abuse became more physical and got to a point where he was trying to, to kill us, you know? And then in June of 1999, we made an irrational dis a decision and we took his life. Um, it was a point where he was trying to kill us and it was, uh, it was the thought process where it's either him or us. 
And it took, a, we buried the body. We didn't know what to do. We didn't have a car or anything like that, so we buried the body. It took them four months to find the body. So this was some of the hardest time of my life. Here I am living with the fact that I had taken somebody's life. I'm dealing with this every day. So the way I dealt with this was drugs and alcohol. I was drunk, I was high, I was drunk and high every day. But I was also working. I'm talking about I was going to work every day because if I didn't go to work, was I going to be able to get drunk or high that night? No. So I knew I had to work to make that money to get drunk and high. So October 29th, 1999, 24 days after I turned 20, it's Friday night, detectives come to Shoney's. I was about to get off work an hour later. Detectives come, come down to the station with us. I go down. In the whole process, I partially confessed to what had happened. I didn't tell them everything that had transpired, etc. So I'm taken to the county jail and I'm booked in on murder. So this is in Alabama. So Texas is a lot like Alabama. In a situation like this, I'm thinking I'm going to get the death penalty. I'm thinking I'm going to get life without parole. So that weekend, I'm crying myself to sleep because here when my life is supposed to be beginning, it's ending because I'm thinking I'm going to be dead in, in Alabama. So I was told that uh, the electric chair in Texas was called Old Sparky. So in Alabama, their electric chair was called Yellow Mama. So I was expecting my life to end in Yellow Mama. So November 1st, 1999, the second chapter of my life began. But it was... After seven hours of sitting in an interrogation room, the detective had taken me over back to the city jail. I'm sat in this interrogation room and I'm sitting there and I'm asking. I'm going through the process, telling, uh, thinking about what had happened to me. What about the abuse? Everything that transpired because I was in this room by myself for seven hours. So finally, I called the detective in and I confessed to the crime. I confessed to the abuse. This was the first time I had ever told anybody about what had happened to me. And that was like this big weight taken off my chest. And so they brought the cameras in and they filmed my confession. The detective handcuffed me, was taking me back to the county jail. I'm asking him, am I going to get the death penalty? Am I going to get life without parole? He turns to me and he's like, do you believe in God? I'm thinking, I'm not studying God right now. What's going to happen to me? Am I going to die? And so I'm like, am I going to get the death penalty? Am I going to get life without parole? He's like, do you believe in God? I'm like, am I going to get the death penalty? Am I going to get life? And so finally, I'm like, yes, I believe in God. He's like, you need to seek him now. So when I got back to the county jail, I asked for a Bible. They gave me a little New Testament Bible. Most people would go to Matthew, Mark, or John, or Romans. I went to Revelations. I grew up in the church. I knew what to say. Let's go to the end of the book, you know. And then I came to Revelations 3.20. that says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door and allows me to come in, I will come in and sup with him. And it was right then I cried out to God, and this peace came over me. I mean, I was in my little six-by-nine cell, praising God, dancing, worship. And if, uh, if one of the corrections officer came by and like looked in there, they probably would have sent me to the psych ward. Like this dude is crazy. He's looking at a murder charge and he's dancing around this cell. That should not be happening. But that was the peace that I had. And it was then where I told myself that I was going to do the time instead of allowing the time to do me. And I really, that was what got me through that whole initial 15 months in the county jail because my brother and I, we had court appointed lawyers. So we didn't have money to pay for a lawyer. Now, a lot of places you have public defenders. Court appointed lawyers are a lot worse because I, I have a lot of friends that are public defenders. I love them. They're so passionate about their work. Court appointed lawyers are people who are forced to do this work. So these are defense attorneys that have to do a certain amount of hours a year as court appointed lawyers. So my brother and I, we had two lawyers that didn't want to do jack for us. I mean, there was one point where I asked him in Alabama, they have this uh, statute that's called youthful offender status. So if you commit your offense, 
and you're under 21, you can apply for this. And if it's granted, the most time that you can get is three years. So I'm thinking, okay, I was 19 when the offense happened. I was 20 when I was arrested. Let me put in for this. So I had to like twist my court appointed lawyer's arm for him to finally put in, me in for it. I'm standing before the judge. My lawyer's talking, etc. The judge finally calls me up. He's like, he's laughing. And he said, rehabilitation is a 70 year old joke. So if you have a, a judge that is saying rehabilitation is a joke, what, were you, what would you expect? And isn't that what the criminal justice, justice system was created on? I mean, I call it the criminal legal system because there's really no justice about it, you know? And as you hear more of this story, you know, you'll see. I mean, he came to us and told us the only plea that the district attorney was going to offer us was 25 years. So we were green to the game. We didn't know that we should have pushed back and said, OK, go tell him to bring us another deal. So we accepted this. When I was talking to my court appointed lawyer before we signed the deal, he's like, hey, if you do all 25 years, you'll still be a young 45. I'm like, I'm thinking, did you really need to tell me that? It's like, you'd be a young 45. I'm 42 right now, so just imagine if I had to spend another three years in prison. I mean, that's just a crazy thought process. Like, yeah, you'll be a young. But what I did was I took advantage of the time. In the county jail, I was able to get my GED. So they had just started a GED program in the county jail. I was one of 11 people that were in involved with this program and 10 of us got our GEDs so 10 out of 11 of the individuals that were with us in the county jail got our GEDs and that's so powerful you know because my whole mentality was this is the first time that I received a degree you know or certificate you know when with the abuse though even through the abuse, I had a 3.5 GPA at, in school. I had some scholarships to play college football. But all of that was thrown away because of the abuse. You know, I didn't have that opportunity to fulfill that. So here it is. I'm in the county jail, and I'm getting this GED, which was so amazing. And it was something that kept that thought process where, okay, when I go to prison, Whatever they offer me, I'm going to take advantage of. So I was able to go through a behavior modification program. This behavior modification program was so powerful. It was, I, I don't really talk about how prison rehabilitates somebody because it's the person that has to do it. Our prisons aren't set up to really rehabilitate somebody or help them change. If somebody has that desire to change, they're going to do it. And so it was in this program where I was reading this book about child sexual abuse. And in this book, it was talking about that when somebody is sexually abused as a child, they blame themselves for what happened to them. And that was like a light bulb that went off. And I was like, wow, you know what? I have blamed myself for this for this whole entire time. So I was able to stop there and look at that 11 year old David and say, this was not your fault. You did not do anything to, to deserve this. This individual who molested you, he was the person that had the problem. And so that was where began the healing process, you know, and I've it's a process, you know, it's going to continue to go on, you know. But I, I talk about two types of people that go through trauma. Excuse me. You have one person that is like a scab. You have one person that's like a scar. So the person that is like a scab, we know that if you have a scab and you hit a scab, what's going to happen? It's going to bleed. It's going to hurt, right? That's what happens when you get triggered. When you have trauma and something triggers you, it's like knocking a scab off. And when you knock that scab off, it heals up. You have a scab again. But what happens if you knock that scab off again? Goes through the whole process of bleeding and pain and hurt. So that's the person that hasn't gone through the healing process. They're that scab. Now the person that has been able to go through the process of healing, 
they are like a scar. Now, if you have a scar, what does the scar tell you? That you went through pain. That at one point you had a cut that went through the process of healing, but now you have that scar. And that scar you can show to other people and be like, this is what healing looks like. So what it is in my life is my brother is like that scab. He hasn't healed from what we went through. Both of us are out of prison, but he hasn't dealt with that trauma. He hasn't dealt with that healing. So he can't talk to people. He's triggered often. We don't have a healthy relationship because he hasn't dealt with the trauma and healed. I'm that person who is able to, to speak so openly about what I've experienced. So many people ask me, they're like, David, how can you just like be so open about it? I'm like, that healing process, you know? And the more you talk about your own trauma and your own pain and your hurt, you have that much more power over it. And that's what's so powerful about healing and sharing your stories, you know, because it's, it empowers you. It gives you that encouragement to continue to tell people. And then I went on, I got the drafting trade, master's in theology. And that picture was when I was 24 years old, when I uh, got the uh, master's in theology degree. I was kind of handsome back then, you know, what happened? <laughs> But then chapter four is the Equal Justice Initiative. How many of you guys have ever heard of Brian Stevenson? Okay, a couple people. So Brian Stevenson is this amazing lawyer out of Alabama. He's actually from Delaware. He went to Eastern University in Philadelphia, and he started this organization called the Equal Justice Initiative. And they were founded really to help people that were on death row and that were not guilty of these offenses to help exonerate them. And so they actually, we got involved with them in 2008 and they really couldn't do anything as far as our case, even though they looked into it and there was a lot of discrepancies and a lot of issues where the lawyers, um, we, we could have got, we could have appealed our sentence and got some changes as far as that because the lawyers did a horrible job. But there was a, the appeal process in Alabama when we were first arrested was two years, then it went to one year, so we were past that period. You know, we were arrested in 99, this was 2008. So what they wanted to do was just assist us on parole. So my brother was able to make parole in 2008, I was able to make parole in 2013. So I was actually released on April 1st, 2013. So what's April 1st? April Fool's Day. April Fool's Day. What do you do on April Fool's Day? Jokes, pranks, everything. I saw your laughing like, yeah, they did it. They did it. So there were, in Alabama, when you leave on parole, you leave Monday morning. Friday is when they begin all the paperwork, blood work, everything to process you out. So I had my blood drawn. I had signed all the paperwork, everything. So I'm waking up Monday morning expecting to like just go. There were two officers that called me over there like, Garlock, your paperwork hasn't come in. You can't go home. I'm like, I'm thinking, y'all. You guys know I like to joke around and have fun, but my freedom is not something I want to joke around about. It's like, let me up out of here. I'm ready to go. So after about 10, 15 minutes, I'm joking around. They're like, OK, you can get out of here and go get dressed and get out. So uh, when I went out into the little room to get dressed, um, since we have a Kentucky fan here, I'll let them know what I put on to exit the facility. So I had a Florida Gator hat my Florida Gator sweatshirt, my Florida Gator belt, and that's how I walked out of prison in Alabama. Now, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was such a joyous day, you know, and the thing, a lot of people ask me, they're like, okay, what's one of the things that really blew your mind as far as like the initial day of you getting out? So with me, it was going to Walmart. So there was a Walmart right down the street. What is so interesting about this prison, though, is that it was in the center of town. It was the center of town. It was called Hamilton Asian Infirmed. It was the prison hospital. 
What was horrible about this place, so I was at this prison for about two and a half years. What was so horrible about this place is they had a Burger King like two doors down. So in the afternoon after we ate this, what you want to call a meat patty in the prison, we'd wa be wa walking outside or playing basketball and we'd get that charred, broiled, wind thing like, it's like, and we just ate whatever they gave us, whatever you want to call that. And it was so horrible, you know, because it's like this big tease, like, we got real food over here while you eat whatever that is that they're feeding you. So right down the street was the Walmart. So we go into the Walmart. So for 13 years, I was using the same tooth, the same type of toothbrush, same type of toothpaste. Same. So here it is. I have like a hundred different choices of toothbrushes, like pink and purple and blue and light blue and dark blue and aqua. And I'm like, OK, what do you do? I'm just like grabbing stuff after a while. But then it's like, I'm like, we have a three hour ride from Hamilton to Montgomery, Alabama. So I was like, okay, I need to use the restroom. So I go into the restroom, I come up to the urinal, I use the urinal. I'm looking for the lever. I'm like, where's the lever? So I like back up and it flushes. I'm like, what? I was like, what? It's like, where have you been all my life? You know? And it was just so baffling. I was like, what in the world? It's like, what am I walking into? You know? And that's only after 13 years, you know? Just imagine if somebody's been locked up 20 or 30 years. There's a gentleman in Pennsylvania that went to prison when he was 15 years old. He served 68 years, and he was just released last year. He was the oldest serving juvenile life forever. Just imagine serving 68 years and going to prison when you're 15. I mean, 13 years and coming out and just everything that's changed, you know. And when people were texting me, they were like texting me like SMH. I'm like, uh, what in the world is that? They're like, shake my head. I'm like, okay, text everything out so I know what you're talking about, you know. And so they were able to help my brother and I, and we got out. And then... I love to talk about the goals, you know, because in prison, we, in one, the behavior modification program I was in, they talked to us about all these different affirmations. One of the affirmations was, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. So that's one thing I was doing, you know, the whole time I was incarcerated, I'm planning as far as what I want to do when I get out, you know. At one point, I wrote out a business plan as far as opening up a home for kids and teens to get them off the streets. That was my plan when I got out of prison and then ended up at Eastern University. I, that's what my first plan was. That's what I want to do. But God had other plans and I'm other places. But this first thing I want to talk about is jobs. So how many of you guys here or online, what is the shortest job that shortest time that you held a job anybody less than a week less than a week how long three days, three days. did you quit yes, okay three days and quit anybody online had shorter than three days no are they paying attention are we getting any questions uh, one day one day Ch chelsea nelson says one day chelsea nelson did you get fired or did you quit Tan Tidwell, one day. Did y'all get fired or did Tan, you quit? Tan, did you get fired? Chelsea, did you get fired or did you quit? They, they are taking the fifth, I think. Okay, well, we won't give it. So I had my first job, which took me a, a, week, a month and a half to get. I only had for a day and two hours. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. One person says 30 minutes. That beats it all. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Tamika Hudson said one day call center, but she quit. Tan quit. Uh, so that's it. 30 minutes. What happened with 30 minutes? What happened, Pamela, with 30 minutes? Okay, we need you guys to come in. Tell us who you are, where you're coming from. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> one person said two hours at FedEx. So anyway, we can go on and on. Okay. So... Just to think about that. So I'm applying for jobs. It took me a month and a half to get this job. So in these applications, I'm talking about McDonald's wouldn't hire me. Burger King wouldn't hire me. Taco Bell. 
around here, if I was around here, Whataburger would, you know. I actually ate a Whataburger the other day because the last time I was in Texas, everyone was like, I was like, I'm going in and out. They're like, you're in Texas. You need to go to Whataburger. And so I went the other day. It was okay. The service wasn't good. So, you know, that's another conversation. So I go into this restaurant. It's Friday afternoon. I'd already been at EJI all morning. So it's 11 o'clock. I walk into this restaurant. I get the application. They give me the application. I'm filling it out. I come to a box. What do you think the box said? Have you been convicted of a felony? So I check it. And I said, I will discuss that interview. I give it to the, the manager. They're like, OK, do you want to be interviewed right now? I'm like, absolutely. Let's do this. 45 minute interview. Guess what question they never asked? Exactly. They did not ask if I had been incarcerated, what I went to prison for, whatever. This is the first place that they didn't ask. I'm like, I like this place. This is cool. They're like, do you want to come to work at four o'clock? I'm like, I'll be here at three thirty. So I got there at three thirty. I was ready to work. So from four p.m. to two a.m., I'm jamming. I'm in the dish room, just washing away, making seven fifty an hour, just jamming away. The kitchen manager was so pleased with my work. He brought me three different plates of food the whole shift. So I'm like washing dishes with one hand, eating food with the other because I didn't want to like take the plate, go sit down and him think I was lazy or something, you know. So I'm just like washing and eating. 2 a.m. I get off. I have a 45 minute walk home. This is in... This was in June. So it's 2 a.m. in the morning. I have a 45 minute walk home. It's nice, cool night, morning. I'm walking home. This is like the best walk ever because I got a job. I felt so relieved and happy, excited. When I left the next day, I go in at 4 o'clock. 5.30, the general manager was like, hey, can I talk to you outside? I was like, yes, ma'am. We go outside. She's like, um, I see that on your application you have a felony. I was like, yes, ma'am. She's like, can you tell me about it? So I tell her the story that I've already shared to you. What happened to my brother and me, what we did, what we did in prison, what my goals were and objectives. She's like, I'm sorry that happened to you, but I have to fire you because we have a company policy a company policy that says we can't have anybody who's committed a violent offense work here. So I go from this extreme high the, on Friday to this extreme low. So that 45 minute walk home was really rough. And I'm texting people telling them I got fired and why I got fired. And everybody's like, man, I feel so sorry for you. I'm sorry that happened, etc." And so I'm back at it, you know, applying for jobs. A week later, I get a better job. Working as a dishwasher, making $9 an hour. My boss there was, I actually had to treat him like a corrections officer because he was cursing me out three days a week and I'm doing everything right. But I had to treat him like a corrections officer, just telling him, yes, sir, no, sir, thank you, sir. Because if I cursed him out or anything like that, what would have happened? I would have been fired and I would have taken another two, three months to get another job. But do you guys want to know what crazy thing happened a week after I got this new job? I'm walking by this restaurant. The kitchen manager is outside smoking a cigarette. He calls me over there. He's like, David, come on over here. I was like, hey, what's up? He's like, do you want a job? I was like, what? He's like, yeah, do you want a job? I was like, didn't I get fired two weeks ago because of my background? He's like, we don't have a company policy like that. That was just the general manager's issues. That's exact. I'm like, what in the world? But that's the thing. When you have a background, you don't just have to deal with company policies. You have to deal with individuals and their own biases, you know. This woman, 
This general manager was fired a week after she fired me, not because she fired me, but, you know, and I'm just thinking like, wow, you know, I got fired because of her issues, you know, and that really like stuck with me. And it's something I always talk about because, you know, when we're talking about people coming out of prison, society says, get a job, get a house, get an education. But what happens? You have these boxes, you have biases, you have all these issues where people are like, well, I'd really like to help you, young lady, but mm, yeah, no. Go somewhere else, get a job somewhere else. You know, ho I hope you do well and get a job somewhere, but you're not gonna work here, okay? But that's how it is, you know? So then nine, uh, nine months after I was out of prison in Alabama, I was able to get my parole transferred from Alabama to Pennsylvania so I could go to college. So I'm enrolled in Eastern University. I'm probably there about six months. I get an email saying I have been nominated for a scholarship. Can somebody read, can, can anybody read the top two lines up there? Okay, so you said the Commonwealth Good Citizen Scholarship. So just imagine me, somebody who's formerly incarcerated, went to prison for murder, gets an email saying, you've been nominated for a Good Citizen Scholarship. What do you think my reaction was? Exactly. I thought it was a joke. I'm like, who in the world is sending me this? Somebody has to be pulling my leg. I'm like, I'm looking around, I'm like, is there a camera set up? You know, am I being pranked, you know? But then I sat down and I'm like, okay. Am I really a good citizen? So I spun the essay that I wrote out where I talked about, in all actuality, if you look at me and judge me for my past, you wouldn't think that I was a good citizen. You would think the total opposite. But because I was there in school, because I was working to better myself and change my life and to give back and to help others, that is why I am considered a good citizen. And in that, I was one of 10 people that won the scholarship. I actually met the person who was over the scholarship and he said my essay was the only one that was accepted and approved by all three judges. So just, I mean, getting the scholarship was one thing, but seeing that all three judges loved the essay and just the way that I expressed about how at one point I wouldn't have been considered a good citizen, but here I am considered a good citizen. It was so powerful. And then that other picture was me graduating college in 2017. So I graduated with a Bachelor's of Arts in Urban Studies focusing on criminal justice and social welfare. Can anybody say that five times fast? Anybody want to try? I mean, I can't even do it, too. I actually had somebody at Eastern, like, she started, she was doing it, but she was doing quietly. She's like, I'm like, no, that's wrong. You have to say it out loud. She's like, okay, I can't do it. But uh, so my degree is an individualized major. So it was a combination of urban studies, criminal justice, and social work. And it's really things that are all go together as far as the work that I do. So I graduated May 6, 2017. May 8th, I started working. And this chapter I call Grace. So I always say this, you know, people ask me, they're like, David, you only took two days off from when you graduated to when you started work? I was like, I had a 13 and a half year vacation. Why did I need any more time? <laughs> okay, yes, I got laughs tonight. Yesterday I shared that and some of the, uh, older folks in there were laughing. Some of the other folks are just like looking at me like, that's not a funny joke. You need a new joke writer. So, you know, I'm glad you guys all laughed. That's good. I can tell my, my wife that I got laughs today. But uh, so my wife actually found this job like three months before I graduated. She found it on Idealist. So Idealist is this amazing... Um, place where nonprofits uh, put out their jobs as far as jo uh, 
interns, jobs, etc. It's for n people interested in nonprofits. So my wife found this job. She's like, hey, check this out. It's a reentry program in Lancaster, which if uh, any of you guys ever heard of uh, Weird Al Yankovic, remember that song, Amish Paradise? So I live in Amish land. So I'm there seeing all these buggies and everything. So yeah, it's definitely an interesting area to live in. So I get this, I apply for the job. First call I have with the executive director, he's like, hey, can you tell me your story? So I tell him my story, I tell him about the sexual abuse, murder, et cetera. He's like, David, uh, we primarily work with people who have committed sexual offenses. Do you think you can work with this population? I was like, absolutely, because of grace, because of mercy, because of forgiveness, you know, and it goes back to my faith. And one of Brian Stevenson's quotes, too, is you're not as bad as the worst thing you've ever done. So if I wanted people to look at me not as somebody, not as a murderer, how did I have to look at these men who had committed a sexual offense? So that's what I did. You know, I didn't look at them as a sex offender. I looked at them as a man who committed a sexual offense. So I separated the person from the act. And I, I had this job for three years. It was so powerful, you know. The, the name of the ministry is New Person Ministries. The, the verse that it came from is 2 Corinthians 5.17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And that's how I looked at these men. I looked at them as a new person. And I would always tell them that your past does not define you. It's what you do today. It's what you do tomorrow. That is what defines you. And so many people are like, I don't get this. How can you do that? You know, and do you guys know about restorative justice? So restorative justice is this amazing true justice, you know, that we need to get to because it provides healing for everybody that's been harmed by the system. It provides healing for the victim, the victim's family. It provides healing for the person that's committed the harm. It provides healing for the community. And that's how I looked at this work because a lot of these men are never going to be able to talk to their victim because there's not many programs that allow people who've committed a sexual offense to talk to the person they harmed. So I was able to be their victim by proxy. I was able to help them with the, the healing process. And when you think about people who have committed a sexual offense, 35 to 75 percent of them have been sexually abused themselves. Now, I say that not to condone what they did, but it allows people to understand that this is something that's generational. It's something that they were a victim to. And as they were victimized, they were victimized by somebody who was close to them. 95% of sexual offenses happen by somebody the person is familiar with, a family member, a, a, a teacher, a coach, etc. The stranger danger does not happen much, about 5% of the time. So this is somebody who is close to this individual who is supposed to love them, who is supposed to care about them. And they're showing them this distorted love through these sexual actions. And so they get this distorted thought process that this is how you show love to somebody. And they go on in life if it's not uh, corrected and they offend and show love in that same way. And so just having those conversations and helping them was so powerful, you know, and out of the men that have been there, there's probably a hundred men that were there in the three years I was there. Three people have gone back to prison. Two for technical violations and only one for committing another sexual offense. And I say that because society wants to say that people have committed sexual offenses, they're monsters, they're never going to change. But when you look at studies, it, the, the rate that somebody commits another sexual offense is only 1.5 to 5.5 percent. So this is something I always talk about because it's about educating you all. It's about letting you guys know that, you know, these individuals, we can't continue to label them. We can't continue to call them a sex offender and say that this is who you intrinsically are. We have to look at them as human beings 
and give them an opportunity, give them a second chance. So the next chapter is about the work that I'm doing now. So the work that I'm doing now is I'm uh, the program, the Pennsylvania State Organizer for an organization called Straight Ahead. So what we're doing in Pennsylvania, one-tenth, so one out of ten people serving life without parole in the country are in Pennsylvania. So there's 55,000 people serving life without parole in Pennsylvania, I mean uh, in the country. As I was shared earlier, there's only a thousand in Texas. So five times of what you have in Texas is in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania's prison population is 39,000. What is Texas's? So y'all have almost a hundred more thousand incarcerated folks in Pennsylvania. But there's 4,000 more people serving life without parole in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, if you're charged with first or second degree murder, it's automatic life without parole. So Pennsylvania is one of six states that gives automatic life without parole for first degree murder and one of two that gives automatic life without parole for second degree. So what we're doing is we're fighting in the legislature to pass a bill that would just allow parole eligibility. This isn't saying that all 5,447 people are gonna be let out of prison tomorrow. This is just allowing them to have a parole date, to stand before the board and say, okay, that's who I was 20, 30 years ago. This is who I am today. So the average age of somebody when they go to prison in Pennsylvania with a life without parole sentence is 19.8 years old. Their current age is 48.8 years. For all those that do math, how many years is that? 30. Just at 30 years. That's what the average age or average time that somebody has served in a life sentence. I mean, it, it's, it's astounding, you know, and that's what we're fighting for, for that parole. And then to think about elders. Elders in prison is the fastest growing population. But are you seeing an influx of individuals 55 and older committing offenses? No. So why is that population growing so fast? Longer sentences. Hmm? Hard sales. <laughs> Hard sales, longer sentences. Yeah, all these life without parole sentences, these life sentences, these what we call virtual life sentences where it's typically anything over 30 years, we call that a virtual life sentence. I mean, there's times where I'll be reading an article and somebody's been given an 860 year sentence. How can somebody serve 860 years? Unless you're Methuselah from the Bible, you know. But that's the thing, it's like, what is the point? Why are we giving so long sentences, you know? So that's a lot of the work that I'm doing now, passion there. And now I'm at chapter as far as favor and freedom. And so that is my son, Guy Joshua. You, do you like the Florida Gator stuff too? I mean, and so he was born uh, November 30th. 2020. He's 14 months old. Um, I tell people that is what a second chance looks like. Because if I didn't make parole in 2013, I could still be in prison till October 27, 2024. That is when my sentence would have ended. Or if I was in Pennsylvania, I could have received a life without parole sentence and I could still be in prison today. Or in Texas, you never know what type of sentence I would have got here. But, uh, my wife and I, we, we actually met in uh, 2015. So I met my wife uh, April 17th, 2015. We, got uh, we started dating May 17th, 2015. We got engaged July 25th, 2015. We got married August 15th, 2015. 
hey, when you know, you know, right? And we're, we're going to celebrate seven years of marriage and the uh, question. Okay. So Sidney Castro has a question. As an individual who has endured the brutality of the criminal justice system, what occupation in law do you believe an individual should enter that will help the most amount of people and reform the system? I mean, I wouldn't say that there's typically one. I mean, you can do really anything. Um, uh, with somebody who has experienced a lot of brutality and everything, I'd say being a counselor could definitely be beneficial because they could use their lived experience to help others heal. Kind of like I was talking about as far as the scabs and the scores, you know, and typically after a presentation, you know, there's typically at least one person that comes up to me and shares with me about being sexually or physically abused themselves, you know. So being able to use that story, their story and to show how they've been able, able to overcome different things gives encouragement and power to other people. And, and that's what it's about. Uh, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. It says, God is a God of comfort and tender mercies, and he comforts us so we can comfort others. And that's what I've done. I've been gone through that healing process. I've received that comfort and that compassion, and now I'm able to give it to other people, you know, and then when they receive it, they are able to give it to somebody else, you know, and it's this huge ripple effect, you know, the amount of people that we're able to, to impact and touch. I mean, if we reach one person and help one person, you could, in, at the end of your life, you could help millions of people because they're helping somebody else and helping somebody else and helping somebody else. So, I mean, I'd say that in as that aspect, counseling would definitely be something good. Um, I mean, going into law, being a defense attorney, you know, or a public defender would be good, you know, because they'd be able to be on the front lines fighting for these individuals, you know. What is the best way for people to become involved in the organizations that focus on criminal justice system reform? Um, I'd say uh, meet my friend Savannah over here. She's doing amazing work here. Um, just Twitter is a perfect way to find people who are doing criminal justice reform. I love Twitter. I've met so many people on Twitter who are doing criminal justice reform in Pennsylvania, all over the country, all over the world, you know? And that's the thing, it's about networking. You know, go on LinkedIn, go on Twitter, Facebook, Google or search criminal justice reform organizations, you know? Um, I'd say some of the better national organizations, Vera Institute of Justice, the Sentencing Project, uh, Prison Policy Initiative, ARC, um, which is Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Um, if you know people or you are a family member who has people that have been incarcerated, there's an amazing training program called Just Leadership USA. It takes individuals who are formerly incarcerated and family members and trains you to be better advocates. So there are so many different organizations across the country and you can find local ones here that you can get involved with, plug in, use your voice. And that's what's so powerful about it. Thank you. Um, did a few men, Dulce Balcazar asks, did a few men regret their mistakes from the ones you helped? Did a few men regret their mistakes, regret what they did? Yeah, I mean, most of them were always regretful for what they did, you know? Uh, they, I mean, there were times where me and them would just be crying in my office, you know, because they were just being gut level honest about what they did and how they wished they could go back and change it, you know? But when you come into offense, you can't go back and change it. But what you can do is you could change from today. I tell a lot of people, you know, your past does not define you. Your past is what educates you. So my past has educated me. It's not what defines me. What defines me is what I'm doing today. It's what I do tomorrow. That is what defines me. And that's what we have to tell people, you know, that that is the definition of 
being defined. It's not what has been done in the past because you can't change that. I mean, I can't go back to when I was 11 years old and change what happened to me. I can't go back when I was 19 and change what happened as far as the murder. But what I can do today is not let myself continue in that path. I mean, if I allowed that to define me, I could easily be out there abusing children, you know, or abusing women or anything like that. But I have gone through the process of healing and that doesn't affect me in that way. And I'm allowing what I've gone through to help other people. Thank you. Um, does Pennsylvania have the death penalty? Um, Pennsylvania has the death penalty, but they've put a moratorium on it. So they haven't been uh, putting anybody to death lately. Okay. And because each individual varies, what is the best way to seriously promote rehabilitation within the prison? Uh, the best way to do that is we need to, first, we have to get away from the sentencing that we have now. Because when the district attorney has all the power, the judge has no discretion to give a different sentence if there are mitigating circumstances. So right now, like in Pennsylvania, let's use that as an example. If you are charged with first or second degree murder, you get life without parole. The judge, it doesn't matter. If my offense happened in Pennsylvania and I was charged with first degree murder and I took it to trial and I was found guilty, the judge couldn't have said, okay, I feel sorry about you because of what happened to you as a kid. He's like, life without parole. So a lot of what has to change is sentencing. Um, as far as in prison, reentry needs to be again on day one. So we have 2.3 million people incarcerated right now in county jails, state prisons, and uh, federal prison. What percentage of that population do you think is going to be released from prison? What, what? 95, 96%. So think about that. 96% of 2.3 million is what? About 2.1 million? So 2.1 million people of 2.3 million people are going to be released from prison. Don't you think we should be doing more to rehabilitate them, to prepare them? The number one thing that helps somebody to reduce recidivism rates is education. It reduces recidivism rate by 43 to 48%. So that's just if somebody gets a bachelor's degree. If somebody's able to get a master's degree, the rate that they recidivate is 2%. If somebody is able to get a PhD degree, do you guys know what the recidivism rate for somebody who gets a PhD in prison? Zero, exactly, zero. But 92, Crime bill, Bill Clinton, like, yeah, no, take away that education. But recently it's been restored. The Pell Grant's been restored. So there's actually a lot more schools that are going back into the prisons to offer education. I'm actually speaking at a conference on Saturday up in Dallas uh, at the Council of Christian Colleges and Universities about prison education because it's so powerful. And what it does is it gives that person hope and it gives that person the skills for when they get out of prison to succeed. Um, okay, so um, this woman, Dulce, is uh, saying she's pursuing a career in law and hoping to become an attorney. How would you recommend going to reform the justice system to actually focus on rehabilitation, especially for youth? Um, a lot of it is we, we have to change the laws, you know? So a lot of it starts with politicians. It starts, starts with lawmakers. We have to pass laws that keep juveniles in juvenile court. Stop charging all these individuals, these 11, 12, 13 year olds as adults. Um, we, we need to take all the money that we're pouring into prisons, pour into communities. We need to create programs where 
we have folks that are formerly incarcerated mentor kids that are in juvenile facilities. I mean, there's a lot of organizations, programs like that across the country, and they're so successful because a lot of times these kids that are going to these facilities don't have healthy male role models. Who better than somebody that has already been incarcerated and is out, out and thriving, succeeding, to let them know, okay, <laughs> the street life, yeah, it's fun and fast and money and everything, but <laughs> I spent 15, 20, 30 years in prison. It's not worth it. And then they're able to pour into these kids, you know, create relationships and bonds and that is thing. Um, and then, I mean, if she's going into law, I mean, she could create her own organization where she's just totally focused on juvenile justice issues, you know? So this person writes, God's grace to you. How are you handling your mental stability? Um, it, it's, I, I see counselors. I, I mean, the, my faith is a thing that's really beneficial there. And just continuing to just focus on what's ahead of me and not what's behind me and just being able to share my story. You know, the more I share, the more power I have over what's happened to me. And, you know, it is so powerful, you know, to help other people begin that healing process. And that one of, one of the affirmations that I always remember as far as in prison, too, is it said when person A helps person B, Person A reaffirms what they already know. So what that is saying is, if I help my brother here, I give him wisdom, I give him insight, encouragement, he gains it. But do you know what I'm doing with me? I'm just saying, okay, this is what I have to remind. This is what I have to re remind myself about, you know. And so that's what a, a lot of it is for is the mental health and, and stuff there. And I mean... My wife has been very beneficial in that, too, because when we met, uh, she knew all about my past. You know, I was open on this and she began reading books about sexual abuse, child sexual abuse. So she could understand where I was coming from. Now, there's a lot of times you don't have that where you have a spouse or somebody who wants to put forth that effort to understand you. So there are times where. We have an argument. I'm talking about we have a knock down, drag out argument. And I'll shut down. Because at times that is the mechanism that I used back in the day when I had to shut down to not deal or experience as much pain or hurt as far as the abuse, as far as the, the being hit and beaten. So I'll do that at times in our relationship and my wife will like correct me. She's like, David, you're doing it. And then I have to like snap out of it and then just have that conversation. So having somebody in your life who understands and knows what you've been, gone through and can challenge you when you start using those coping mechanisms is incredible and amazing. Thank you. Uh, Juana asks, do you know any organization that focuses on a, on a system reform for helping juveniles, juveniles in Texas that were sentenced to life? I do not know any. So, Texas Center for Justice and Equity. So tex say it again, Texas? Texas Center for Justice and Equity. And Collective Action for Youth. And Collective action. action for Youth. So how, how can they reach out to you with more questions? Uh, if you can follow me on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Be Frank for Justice is my organization. Be Frank for Justice. Yeah. So follow Be Frank for Justice. So wait, hold on a second. Are you a student here? No.
Okay, so there is a there is a woman here for those of you who are online who uh, works for uh, who is a nurse and she works for several organizations uh, throughout the state of Texas that focuses on criminal justice reform essentially, and she has a Twitter. Uh, I'm so old. What do you call a Twitter handle? Account. Account. Twitter. Oh, shut up, Kevin. Um, okay. Twitter at B so, Frank. <laughs> I saw you shaking your head. <laughs> what is what is the um, what is it? B Frank. Oh, sorry. B Frank. Number four justice. B Frank. Number four justice. Okay, so be frank for justice, and it's Savannah Eldridge. Yeah, and she's here because we're friends on Twitter, and I told her I was going to be in the area. She's okay. like, when, where? I want to be there. And so, yeah. So there you go. That's the example of networking in action. Okay, exactly. so Twitter, that's what it's if about. If it would have been a self-defense charge and not a murder charge, how much time in prison would you have done? So in alabama we were just charged with murder so in alabama just a murder charge carries 10 years to 99 to life so if they wanted to give us a self-defense charge it would have been uh, called justifiable homicide and it would have been a one to ten year sentence so th it depends on what type of sentence they would have given me but i wouldn't i wouldn't have served more than 10 years okay um were you ever in a program like such? I don't know what that refers to. How has this affected your family and friends? Well, I mean, while I was incarcerated, my mom, my dad, my grandma, sister all passed away. So really, the only family that I have, immediate family, is my brother. And uh, we have like a Facebook relationship. We really don't have a healthy relationship because he hasn't dealt with the trauma. He hasn't dealt and, and healed from that, you know. Um, what's been so amazing is my wife and her family, they, tr they've they accepted me. They don't judge me as far as my past, my background. And really so many people ha look at me, not as well as I've done, but as who I am today, you know, and it's so powerful. You know, the, the church that my wife and I go to, we're involved with serving and on different leadership stuff. We've taught uh, small groups and different things like that. So that's what's so amazing is like when you find individuals that don't judge you by your past, but judge you as far as what you're doing now. And it's incredible. You know, I we all know the African proverb. It takes a village to raise a child. Right. So my spin on that is it takes a village to allow a returning citizen to be successful. So it takes the person's family, it takes the community, it takes employers, it takes a place of faith, it takes support groups, it takes all these individuals to come around this person that's getting out of prison. And when you have that, this is something that person's never had before because people are now speaking life into them, telling them you can be whatever you want to be. You can go to college, you can start that company, you can do this or that. All their life, what have they been told? They're useless. They're nothing. They're going to go back to prison. I mean, what's really jacked up about prison is there's a lot of corrections officers that are going to put a pool. They're going to gamble on when somebody's coming back to prison. So I have like six or seven of the corrections officers that I know in prison. I'm friends with on Facebook and everything. We chat all the time. I was calling up the prison about seven months after I got out to talk to my friend. One of these other guys, one of these other corrections officers answered answer the phone like, what are you calling up here for? You're out of prison. Go do your life, etc." They're like, yeah, we got a pool on you. I put that you're coming back in eight months. I was like, man, I wish I could collect. I've been out almost nine years, you know. <laughs> but it's so it's so crazy that they're going to gamble on and say when you're going to come back to prison. You would think that they want you to stay out, but if you stayed out, they're probably not going to have a job then, right? So Barbara Taylor. Oh, wait, we got a question. Oh, right I'm here. sorry. Why do you think your brother was able to uh, go up earlier than you? 
Well, so the, the question is, why was David's brother able to get out earlier, four years earlier than you? Yeah, and so I went up for parole in 2009, right, at, or, yeah, right after he did, and the attorney general was trying to get reelected. And so he, anybody that had a violent offense or a sexual offense, he was being tough on crime and saying, we're not letting them out. And so I was set off five years, got two years knocked off, and then came up and out in 2013. <laughs> Always. So Barbara Tate has a question. How has trauma-informed care helped you and improved your life? And can trauma-informed care be combined with spirituality, such as combining principles from the Bible, and will it be effective? Uh, I, I guess mean, the first question, how has trauma-informed care helped you and improved your life? I mean, trauma-informed care is something that I talk about all the time. In Pennsylvania, what's amazing about that is, you know, Pennsylvania is really progressive as far as a lot of the stuff they're doing. Their new uh, Secretary of uh, Corrections actually wants to make the Department of Corrections trauma-informed care. So he wants everybody to know about trauma and to understand trauma because so many people don't understand as far as trauma don't understand uh, adverse childhood experiences you know and realizing that what's hap what happens to us as children affects us the rest of our life and what we need to do is we need to get to the place where we pour more money into our children and talking to them about trauma and helping them to heal because how many people know that adage hurt people hurt people that's what happens you know and my addition to that is hurt people hurt people but help people help people and heal people heal people and that's where we have to get to you know and that's why uh, like tomorrow, you know, I'll be speaking at University of North Texas and I'm going to be talking about trauma, you know, trauma informed care and the necessity of getting that where you go through the healing process, you know. And I mean, I don't think there's really uh, any difference between trauma informed care and spiritual biblical stuff because it's all the same thing, you know, it's about allowing God to heal you, you know, and that's the process as you go as for sanctification. It's a point where you're being changed into more like Christ. So uh, a plug for our next Vital Voices, which is next Tuesday night, we have a national renowned expert on trauma and grief uh, coming to speak uh, at a Vital Voices. It'll be a virtual only presentation um, and uh, she will be coming back in April. Next week, her focus is on education, on trauma informed care for children, uh, public school children. And uh, in April, she'll be talking specifically to social workers and criminal justice professionals on trauma informed care, uh, trauma and grief for um, uh, young people in the criminal justice system. Um, what was, the, oh, we already answered that question. But wait, wait, can I, let, let me uh, go back here one slide. So has anybody seen the movie Just Mercy? You seen the movie Just Mercy? You seen the movie Just Mercy? Did you see me in it? You didn't watch it then. <laughs> so I'm actually in the movie Just Mercy. Uh, I got a call from Brian Stevenson in 2018. It was August 2018. He's like, hey, do you want to be in a movie? I'm like, is that actually a question you have to ask somebody? It's like, just sign me up. You know, yes, I will be in the movie. You know, like twist my arm like, okay, I'll be in the movie. So September 5th, 2018, we were down in Atlanta. It, most of the film was actually filmed at Tyler Perry Studios. The rest of it, I mean, some of it was filmed in Alabama where they had to get the pictures of downtown Montgomery and stuff. And we filmed the, the rest, like all the prison scenes were actually, uh, the inside prison scenes were filmed at this uh, closed jail in, outside of Atlanta. So we're there filming it. Brian Stevenson said that he wanted four of his clients to play these roles instead of four actors because we had the lived experience. Now, this is what Brian Stevenson always does. His main thing is he wants to change the narrative. He wants people to be proximate to the system. If you want to change the system, you got to get proximate to it. That's why one thing, there's a lot of organizations that are telling politicians, if you want to really change the prison system, 
visit a prison. Go talk to the men and women that are in prison. Don't just say, sit back and watch Orange is the, Blue, Orange is the New Black and be like, oh, I know what prisons are like. Go see somebody. So we got down there and we thought we were just going to get like a script, you know, and like read, memorize lines, whatever. They're like, no, you're going to share your own story. So each one of us shared our own story for 18 to 20 minutes. And so the three lines that I have in the movie are part of my own story. So two of the lines I shared with you earlier today. So when you guys watch the movie, you'll be like, yeah, he said those two things when he was talking. And so it was an amazing opportunity. Michael B. Jordan was so down to earth. He was thanking us for being in the movie and just taking opportunity to just share our stories like that. It was an amazing experience and opportunity and something I'll never forget. And I mean, I tell a lot of people, it's like when I think about what I've been able to achieve in the last nine years, I was like, if you told me when I got out of prison, April 1st, 2013, that all of these things would happen in the first nine years, I'd be like, OK, you are smoking some good dope. Let me have some, you know, but I, I would have been like, yeah, no way. Not, none of that stuff's going to happen. And here it is. It's like sometimes I'm like, can you pinch me? So actually. One thing I want to do real quickly is so. This is somebody coming out of prison. So how does society label this person? What do they call him? Ex-convict. Felon. Felon. Criminal. So how many of you guys have ever stolen anything? Raise your hand. Okay, keep your hand up. You've never stolen anything. Cookie out of the cookie <laughs> jar. Okay. Hey, thief. Hey, thief. Hey, thief. Why, why did you look down? Did, did you not like being called a thief? No? Hey, thief. I, gotta, I definitely got to call you. Hey, thief. <laughs> hey, thief. So how did you guys like being called a thief? You didn't like it, right? So you might have stolen something out of the cookie jar like 30, 40 years ago, right? <laughs> but I'm calling you a thief for something you did 30 years ago. Have you changed? Are you still stealing? Uh, don't answer that. You know that like <laughs> we do have a police officer over here, so don't answer that. But that's the thing, you know, if you call somebody... If you call me a murderer, I committed a murder back in 1999. Am I that same person? No. So labels are so important. So somebody that is in prison right now, they're not an inmate. Call them a human being. Call them somebody that's incarcerated, an incarcerated person, a justice impacted person. That is giving them their humanity back. You're not labeling them by the worst thing they've ever done. When somebody comes out of prison, don't call them a convict. Don't call them an ex-offender. This returning citizen, uh, formerly incarcerated, call them a human. Call them by their name. For 13 and a half years, I was known as 214579. That was my prison number. When I got mail, they didn't say David Garlock. They didn't say Mr. Garlock. It would have been nice, you know. But they're like 21, 45, 79. So labels are so important. You know what we say about people, just like you didn't want to be called a thief for the rest of your life. So just imagine, you know, going back to applications. What how would you feel if a job when you were applying for a job asked you to put the worst thing you've ever done down? But somebody that's been incarcerated, we have to do that. We have to part the, what if they ask you like, have you ever stolen anything in your life? Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever gotten in a fight? How many of you do you think could get a job if you had to put all that stuff down? But people that are incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, we ask them to put the worst thing they've ever done down. 
So, I mean, I don't know as far as in Texas, you know, there's a, a lot of push to ban the box. So I don't know what is happening in Texas. Wait, hold on a second. Wait, hold on a second. Just get, keep, give her the mic, you know, just like, you want to come up here and, you know, I'll sit down. Um, I, it, it varies by county. Um, different counties have been successful in passing um, like municipal bills to ban the box. But the problem is always like in implementation because people still have um, the right, you know, they reserve the right to make those choices. So, um, but yeah, the, I mean, it varies. I know Houston, I think they did successfully pass it, but I don't believe that people are um, like pushing it. So there are some organizations working on that also. Well, we need to push it. We need to ban the box to allow these individuals to have an opportunity to not be judged by the worst thing they've ever done, you know. So I know it's getting close to wrapping up time. So I wanted to go ahead and put my connections up there for anybody, Facebook, Twitter, and uh, email. One thing I always tell people is I, I love to connect with people. I love to help people. If you guys are students here, you guys have any assignments, you need somebody to interview, questions, reach out to me. Um, I'll connect you with Savannah if you have questions for her. And you know, I, I just want to, it's not just about coming here and speaking tonight. It's about being a, a connection for you moving forward, you know, and just being able to connect and help you and just to see how we can change this system. David, I have, I appreciate that, but this is an important question, so I thought I want to ask it. A lot of parents have asked about those scared straight programs. How can we bring those back, um, and were they effective? And another question from another person is, what would you tell kids that have, well, answer that question first. No, actually, actually, let's uh, bring that mic over here to this police officer we have in here. And... <laughs> 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 so, scared straight. Is it effective? No. And, and everybody in here, when you ask that question, was shaking their head because it's not. You know, what, what is it really going to scare somebody about? You know, what we need to do is we need more programs, like I was talking earlier, where we connect people that are formerly incarcerated, that are successful and connect them with these individuals. So yesterday I was on a panel, or I, uh, I was hosting a panel, and three of the people, three of the four people on the panel were formerly incarcerated, all working in reentry. Those are the people that we need to have conversations with these young individuals that are getting in trouble. It allows them to share their story, but scaring somebody is not gonna change them. Because if scared straight worked, our juvenile facilities would be empty, our prisons would be emptying, because everybody would be scared. You know, deterrence does not work. There's study after study after study. You know, everybody's like, oh, yes, let's keep the death penalty. It's deterring people from committing murder. It's like, in Philadelphia, there was 560 murders last year. I don't think deterrence is actually working. So, scared straight, deterrence does not work. We need to pour into communities. We need to have mentors. Mentorship is what works. All right, final question for the evening. Unless, does anyone here have a question? No? Okay. Final question. What would you tell kids that have gone through what you went through when you were being molested? What would have helped you back then, if anything? Uh, a lot of it is... So I believe that we need to do away with the sexual offender registry because it does not help anybody. And we need to take that money that is involved with the registry to pour into education, to pour into prevention. What would have helped me is if I was told as a young boy that if anything ever happened like that, that I could tell somebody and that person would believe me and would take whatever actions needed to be taken but at that point I didn't know what I was 11 years old I really had never had any conversation like that and this man told me that if I told anybody he would kill me so if I had somebody 
who had told me, if anything like this ever happens, you can come to me. I'm going to trust you and we will take care of what needs to happen legally. That would have changed everything. The abuse would have stopped. I could have started getting healing then and my life would have been different. So that's why I believe that we need more education. We need more prevention. And the people that are committing sexual offenses right now are not people who've gone to prison for committing a sexual offense. These are people in our communities who know our children or know these adults and they commit these offenses. So why get rid of the sexual offender registry? A lot of parents would want to say, I want to know if a sexual offender is living next door to me or down the block. I have young kids. What would you say to that? I would say, what does knowing that have anything to do with them offending your child? You know, just, just knowing if that's the case, why don't we want to know if there's a murderer down the street or why don't we, we want to know if there's a drug uh, somebody that was selling drugs. I mean, should we have a registry for everybody? I mean, what if there's somebody that has committed domestic violence down the street and we don't know about it and then we're like, hey, do you want to go out on a date? And they've committed domestic violence in the past, you know? So that mentality is like, okay, should we know what everybody's done? I mean, we can't have, <laughs> that would be too much for people to track. And the, the fact is, it goes back to the stranger danger. Only less than 5% of sexual offenses happen by people the individual doesn't know. So when we go back to education and when we go back to the point that our kids are made aware that if something happens, we can tell somebody, that changes everything. Okay, so for those of you uh, who might we not, we have question a question. Right what you said about education. Hi. And Lou, and what about you, like, like educations and everything, and you're educating, like, the, the kids. But when, when you're a kid, you don't know any better, even if you are taught, you know, to, to try to recognize all this. But the one that are trying to, should be teaching you is your parents. That should be reinforcing that statement. They're with you four hours a day, much more than a teacher would or a counselor. So wouldn't the education be targeted towards them? It, it's, it would be targeted towards both. Because if a child doesn't know, because a lot of it will start with a child. If a child sees that there's a, a family member or a friend that is coming around all the time offering um, candy or offering this, that, they'll be able to talk to their parents saying, hey, this is like, really weird that this person's offering me all this stuff. And that is the first process of grooming. You know, a lot of people who commit sexual offenses against children, they groom the child to get them where they will trust them more. And they're giving them food. They're giving them Nintendo. Where are we now? 65,000 or whatever, Xbox 10s and everything. And that's what they do. They give them all these things to build up this trust that they're going to trash by committing these offenses. So it's a combination of both educating parents, but also educating um, the, the children, you know, because the children, you know, children are very gullible and very accepting and, you know, will trust anybody. So that's why when you're educating, you're able to have these conversations, you prepare them. So you are gonna end our evening tonight. I just want, for those of you who might not be able to see the screen well at home uh, online, uh, you can connect with David uh, on Facebook, David Lee Garlock, uh, at, on Twitter at David Lee Garlock, and uh, at Gmail at David Garlock, N-P-M, at gmail.com. So thank you all for this evening. Thank you, David, for your presentation. Have Absolutely. a good night, everyone.